This video is still about result interpretation. The last video is about one common issue of interpreting research findings as the so-called facts. In this video, I explain why most published research findings are false. In 2005, a professor named John Ioannidis published an article. The title of the article is why most published research findings are false. This article is considered foundational to the field of meta science. Meta science is also known as research on research and the science of science. It uses research methods to study how research is done and find where improvements can be made. Meta science seeks to increase the quality of scientific research. In 1966, an early meta-research paper examined the statistical methods of 295 papers published in 10 high-profile medical journals. After examining analytical papers, less than 28% were considered acceptable. 5% were judged unsalvageable because the problem posed by the authors could not be solved by the study described. A majority of the analytical papers should have been revised before publication. In almost 73% of the reports read, those needing revision and those which should have been rejected, Conclusions were drawn when the justification for these conclusions was invalid. Meta-research in the following decades uncovered many methodological flaws, inefficiencies, and poor practices in research across many scientific fields, particularly in medicine and the social sciences. In the paper, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, the author wrote, there is increasing concern that most current published research findings are false. The probability that a research claim is true may depend on study power and bias, the number of other studies on the same question, and importantly, the ratio of true to no relationships among the relationships probed in each scientific field. The author also summarized six factors that influence the probability of research findings being false. First, the smaller sample size the studies have, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Small sample size means smaller power. Other factors being equal, research findings from a study with a small sample size are less likely to be true than those with larger sample size. Many research studies in educational leadership are done by using qualitative methods. Qualitative methods do not aim for generalization, but rather to provide a rich contextualized understanding through the intensive study of particular cases. If so, you need to be very careful in your result interpretation. You should not generalize your findings to the entire population. You cannot claim that all of the 10 interviewees in your study believed X and experienced Y, so all school leaders believed X and experienced Y. It is possible that for every 10 interviewees who believed X and experienced Y, there are 100 school leaders who believed and experienced something different. They did not end up in your study probably because of your research design, such as using purposeful sampling instead of random sampling. The second factor that influences the probability of research findings being false is that the smaller the effect sizes, the less likely the research findings are to be true. In statistics, effect size has a particular technical meaning. It refers to standardized effect size, where the effect size is scaled relative to the variance of the measurements. 
Effect size is a number measuring the strength of the relationship between two variables in the population, or a sample-based estimate of that quantity. Studies with a small sample size is likely to exaggerate the true effect size. Examples of effect sizes include the correlation between two variables, the regression coefficient, and the mean difference. Here is an example. In this article published in 2008, authors reported the mean effect sizes for the impact of three leadership types on student outcomes. The mean effect size estimates for the impact of instructional leadership on student outcome is 0.42. The mean effect size estimates for the impact of transformational leadership on student outcomes is 0.11. And the mean effect size estimates for the impact of other leadership types on student outcomes is 0.3. What does it mean? Effect size indicates the strength of the relationship between two variables in the population. The results indicate the impact of instructional leadership on student outcomes is three to four times greater than that of transformational leadership. To interpret the results, the authors wrote, despite the apparently strong difference in the impact of transformational and instructional leadership, cautious interpretation is warranted. As already indicated, there is a considerable range of effects for instructional leadership. Furthermore, the outcome measures used in the transformational leadership studies were predominantly social outcomes whereas instructional leadership researchers tended to focus on academic ones. The authors also wrote, it is also worth noting that leadership effects are not always positive. The mean estimate for transformational leadership was slightly reduced by the results of two studies that found a weak to small negative effect of teacher leadership on student identification and a small negative effect of school administrator leadership on student achievement. The third factor that influences the probability of research findings being false is that the greater number of tested relationships and fewer of the tested relationships are pre-selected, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Researchers often do not pursue just one pre-selected hypothesis, but take a comprehensive approach. Researchers may try many things, collect diverse data of a lot of variables, and then hunt for relationships between variables. Sometimes those so-called significant relationships were not part of the hypothesis developed before the data collection and analysis. This practice is called harking, hypothesizing after results are known. How prevalent of harking in education research? Some researchers have worked to find the answer. In an article titled, Both Questionable and Open Research Practices Are Prevalent in Education Research, published in 2021, the authors reported that they emailed researchers who had published at least one article within the past 10 years between 2008 to 2018 in a journal published by American Educational Research Association or an academic education research journal that had high impact factor. They received 1,488 responses about publishing authors' research practices. When asked about reporting an unexpected finding or a result from exploratory analysis as having been predicted from the start, 55.9% of 864 respondents indicated that practice should never be used. However, 45.8% of 888 respondents indicated that they have engaged in that practice at least once. And it was estimated that 47.26% of their colleagues engaged in that practice.
Research findings are more likely to be true in confirmatory designs than in hypothesis-generating experiments. By hypothesizing after results are known, researchers are explicitly exploring many hypotheses, mostly unstated or conceived after the results are in. The fourth factor that influences the probability of research findings being false is that the greater the flexibility in designs, definitions, outcomes, and analytical approaches, the less likely the research findings are to be true. The fourth factor that influences the probability of research findings being false is that the greater the flexibility in designs, definitions, outcomes, and analytical approaches, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Flexibility increases the potential for transforming what would be negative results into positive results. This covers a wide range of questionable research practices. In the article about questionable research practices in education research, authors reported 10 questionable practices in which publishing authors had a lot of flexibility to get the results they wanted. The questionable research practices include omitting analysis, meaning reporting a set of results as the complete set of analysis when other analyses were also conducted. Omitting non-significant studies or variables, meaning not reporting studies or variables that failed to reach statistical significance or some other desired statistical threshold. Analysis gaming meaning changing to another type of statistical analysis after the analysis initially chosen failed to reach statistical significance or some other desired statistical threshold. Harking, we just talked about that, it's about reporting an unexpected finding or a result from exploratory analysis as having been predicted from the start. Omitting non-significant covariance, meaning not reporting covariance that failed to reach statistical significance or some other desired statistical threshold. Data peaking, meaning collecting more data for a study after first inspecting whether the results are statistically significant. Rounding p-values, meaning rounding off a p-value or other quantity to meet a pre-specified threshold, such as reporting p-value at 0.54 as p-value at 0.05. Data exclusion and arcing after results are known, meaning deciding to exclude data points after first checking the impact on statistical significance or some other desired statistical threshold. Hiding methodological problems, meaning not disclosing known problems in the methods, analysis, or data quality that potentially impact conclusions, and filling in missing data points without identifying those data as simulated. The fifth factor that influences the probability of research findings being false is that the greater the financial and other interests and prejudices, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Conflict of interests are very common in research. Sometimes they are not disclosed. Sometimes they are inadequately reported. Prejudice may not necessarily have financial roots Researchers in a given field may be prejudiced because of their belief in a theory or commitment to their own findings. When you believe in a theory, you are unlikely to question the theory. You tend to see everything from that theory and generate research evidence that further confirms the theory. Such non-financial conflicts may lead to distorted results and interpretations. Distinguished researchers may suppress, through the peer review process, the appearance and the dissemination of findings that refute their favorite theories and findings. In doing so, distinguished researchers can perpetuate false theories and findings. 
don't place too much trust in experts because they are more vulnerable to confirmation bias, being overconfident, and doubling down on their mistakes. Many researchers uncritically follow theories and accept ideas that are proposed by big name scholars. But please remember, researchers, no matter how famous they are, are not saints or prophets. The sixth factor that influences the probability of research finding being false is that the hotter a scientific field with more scientific teams involved, the less likely the research findings are to be true. This seems paradoxical and counterintuitive. Let's look at history. Throughout the history of research, we sometimes see major excitement of a topic, with many teams working on the same topic, and with a lot of data being produced. Timing is of the essence in beating competition. Therefore, each team is incentivized to pursue and disseminate its most impressive positive results. To summarize, a research finding is more likely to be false when the studies have smaller sample size, when effect sizes are small, when there is a greater number and lesser selection of tested relationships, when there is greater flexibility in designs, definitions, outcomes, and analytical approaches, when there is greater financial and other interest and prejudice, and when a scientific field is hot with more teams are involved in chase of statistical significance. In this article in the Wired magazine, the title is Scientists are Wrong All the Time, and that's fantastic. Like what I said earlier, scientists are not saints or prophets. They are human beings with the same biases and preconceptions like non-researchers. So how do you get it right? You use rigorous research methods to generate evidence. But that's not enough. Other researchers should be able to replicate your research and generate the same findings. This process is called replication. It is the ability of a researcher to duplicate the results of a prior study if the same procedures are followed but new data are collected. Unfortunately, we now have a replication crisis in science. Nature is a science journal that has the highest impact factor. In 2016, Nature conducted a survey of 1,576 scientists. More than 70% of the respondents have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiment, and more than half have failed to reproduce their own experiments. The replication crisis exists in education research as well. Recall how many new programs your districts or schools have implemented but failed. In 2013, the Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy reviewed 90 effectiveness trials that were designed to evaluate a previously validated educational intervention. Those interventions include teaching for English learners professional development programs, academic instruction in after-school programs, reading intervention programs, writing intervention programs, and vocabulary development programs in kindergarten. How many of those interventions were effective? According to the report, only 12% of the interventions produced positive results, and 88 of the interventions produced weak or no positive effects. Why were those intervention programs implemented in the first place? It was likely some research findings were used as evidence to justify the importance of the program. Now that you learned why most published research findings are false, a healthy dose of skepticism is necessary as you interpret research findings.